Dignitaries, colleagues, friends, good afternoon. I am presenting this work on the second stage of Indian nuclear program on behalf of our director, Dr. B. Yogi Traman, Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, Kalpakam. This presentation includes the work done at Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research. The emphasis would be mainly on the work done on the fast reactor program, the fuel materials, fuel properties, sodium technology, the sensors envisaged for detecting hydrogen, carbon in liquid sodium, safety aspects, also the isotopes which could be produced in fast reactors. So Kalpakam is not only a picturesque and beautiful place, it's also a very unique complex. It has all the three stages of the nuclear power program. So we have two pressurized heavy water reactors which are operational right from early 1980s, two pressurized heavy water reactors which employ natural uranium oxide as a fuel, heavy water as a moderator and coolant. And then we have uh, HBTR, phosphate test reactor. And this was uh, commissioned and made critical in the month of October 1985. It's been successfully operational for the past 38 years. And also it employs a unique fuel, uranium plutonium mixed carbide fuel. And it is taken to the full capacity in the March 2022. And we also have a small mini reactor, Kalpaka mini reactor, it's commonly, which employs uh, uranium-233 as a fuel. So in that way, all three fissile isotopes are being used at this campus. And this was envisaged in uh, early 1970s by Vikram Saraboy, the fast reactor center. Besides that, we have other units of DAE, BRC facility, safety research, AERB, MAPS, NPCL, then Bhavni, which takes care of uh, PFBR. In addition to that, we have service organizations and HBN. I thought I can share a little bit about the fast reactors, the need for it, and what is the transition. So thermal energy, basically the power reactors, employs typically in the neutron energy of 0 0.025 EV. So typical energy. Whereas fast reactors, like FBTR or the other fast reactors, the typical energies will be from uh, about 200 keV to as high as about 1.5 MeV. The moderating material could be sodium. It's not a good moderator, that's why it has been chosen as the coolant, but it does have some moderation ability. In addition to that, the impurity is present in sodium, however small it may be, like lithium could moderate. The other moderating materials could be your fuel material itself. For example, if you have, if you use uranium oxide, plutonium oxide, mixed oxide fuel, the oxygen could moderate. And if you use mixed carbide fuel, the carbon could moderate. So the typical energies in a BTR varies from about 200 keV to as high as about 1.2 MeV. And these are the typical fuels used, enriched uranium oxide for light water reactors, and uh, natural uranium oxide with uh, heavy water in PHWR reactors, and phosphorated test reactors use uh, mixed carbide fuel at a BTR. In addition to that, we also have irradiated the MOX fuel of uh, uranium plutonium mixed fuel of a particular composition. And uh, the key to fast reactor is these data. The one which uh, its key is, look at the, the fission cross-section for uranium and plutonium, 585 bonds, and uh, the, the capture is about 100 bonds. In other words, in thermal reactors, the fission to capture ratio is very critical. It's about six, actually. Look at the fast rate in thermal reactor for plutonium-239. This number is about three. Though the fission cross-sections are very high, the fission to capture cross-sections are about three. But look at the fast neutron spectrum. This is typically 1.5 MeV. The numbers are pretty close to 1 MeV as well. Look at the fission cross-section data for plutonium. It's 1.95. That means the neutron scans pass through, but look at the fission to capture cross-section data in the fast spectrum region. It's easily about uh, 63 or 65. And uh, also this data is very crucial for fast reactor. Neutron per fission, plutonium uh, dominates over all other isotopes. Yeah. Before I get into the details of the BTR program, just have a one quick look at the fission yields. Nuclear fission of uranium and plutonium produce about 400 isotopes. The fission products ranges right from mass 74, that is germanium, 
to dysprosium 161. Of course, the yields of germanium was about 10 power minus 6, but it starts right from there. The fission products produced include alkali, alkaline metals, transition metals, noble metals, noble gases, lanthanides, and activation products, for example, americium, curium, neptunium, and in a bit here, we have manganese 54 and cobalt 60 from structural materials as well. In other words, we have alkali and alkaline earth metals, which include cesium, barium, strontium, and rubidium. These four dominate in the alkali and alkaline earths. In the case of transition metals, it's mainly dominated by zirconium and molybdenum. The noble metals, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, the noble gases, xenon and krypton, lighter lanthanides only are produced in nuclear fission, heavier lanthanides are not produced. That is lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, promethium, samarium, europium. These are the lanthanides that are produced and gadolinium is produced in very small yield. After gadolinium onwards, there is no production of heavier rare earths. So this is how it is. The key is fast fission of either uranium or plutonium produce more noble metals. But two, plutonium fission invariably, whether in the thermal region or fast region, produce more noble metals. That's the key. Of course, in the left side, you have uh, dominated by zirconium and molybdenum isotopes. In fact, molybdenum 95 dominates for uranium fission and molybdenum 98 dominates for plutonium fission. In the case of the right side of the hump, you have xenon-134 and cesium-135, which dominates for uranium-235 and plutonium-239 fissions, respectively. Yeah, this is the number which I was talking to you. The need for plutonium as a fuel in the fast reactors, the key is this number, the average number of neutrons released for fission, it's about three, and the number of fission neutrons produced for absorption in fuel, that's about 2.9. This is for about 1.5 MeV neutrons. So, Plutonium as a bleeding material because the numbers are fairly good and uh, uranium-233 has a reasonably good numbers in the thermal region. As far as coolants are concerned, light water and heavy water are used in um, light water reactors and precious water reactors. Liquid metals are used as a coolant in phosphate reactors. That includes sodium because sodium melts at about 98 degrees. It boils at about uh, uh, 883. That means it's one metal to me which has a very, very long liquid range, like gallium actually, you know. It has a very long liquid region. It's a poor moderator and uh, the neutronics are very good, you know. It will keep the neutron spectrum reasonably hot and on activation it produces sodium-24. Of course, it has a very short of life, 15 hours, so it could be easily managed, economics, compatibility with the clad and the fuels. So everything makes sodium as a the best material. Sodium potassium alloy comes pretty close because it's a low melting eutectic. Of course, it's a bit more reactive compared to sodium. So otherwise, it's also a reasonably good choice. Lead bismuth and mercury are the alternate ones. Lead bismuth, especially for SMRs, could be an option in the future. Lead as a material is good. Bismuth could produce polonium as an activation product. So is mercury, you know. It can form some activation products. Otherwise, uh, sodium stands uh, number one as a Coolant materials for the fast reactor. So just quick summary, liquid metal fast beta test reactor employs fast neutrons, there is no need for moderator. <coughs> a liquid metal is used as a coolant, invariably sodium. The fast neutrons are preferred option and uh, if uranium, natural uranium can be effectively utilized only in the fast reactor. So as plutonium 239 and 240, you have a combination of 70, 30 or 80, 20. That's fast reactors are the best option for burning the materials. Conversion of thorium to 233, uranium 233 using as blankets. Minor actinide burning, neptunium, plutonium, americium. Neptunium, curium and americium especially. They have long off-lives, could be effectively burnt in fast reactor. As I said, fast reactors are the major source of uh, platinum group metals, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium. If you typically look at thermal reactor. The yields of uh, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium could be about 0.7 kg per ton. Whereas in fast reactor, for the similar burn-up, it's about 2 kg per ton. But when the burn-up is about 100,000 megawatt days per ton, it could be about 20 kg per ton. That means fast reactors are the huge source for noble metals, especially palladium, because most of the isotopes of palladium are 
non radioactive which are produced in fission palladium 104567 8 and 10 except 107 which has a fairly long half life otherwise you can consider it as uh, one of the huge source uh, the noble metals from fast reactors of course the the neutron high neutron flux offers an opportunity for producing radio pharmaceutical as well so in calfarcom we have uh, opportunities for producing strontium 89 phosphorus 32 which i will discuss in the due course so breeding ratio is greater than 1 high thermodynamic efficiency the temperature power coefficient are negative less thermal pollution to the environment transmutation of minor actinides as i said then reduction in the waste management makes fast reactor programs very interesting Yeah, the FBTR, just quick glance, commissioned in 1985. It employs a unique uranium plutonium mixed carbide fuel, which was developed at BARC in collaboration with IGCAR. The coolant is sodium. Boron carbide enriched is used as a control rod material. The fuel has seen a burn up as is about 165 gigawatt days per time without fuel failure, and the radio isotopes are produced as well. So it's a 40 megawatt, 10 megawatt electrical Mark One. uses about 70% plutonium carbide and 30% uranium carbide the peak lhr is about 400 watts per centimeter the peak flux 10 power 15 neutrons per meters per second which enables production of radio isotopes as well this is quick uh, summary about the common reactor is uranium 233 fuel 30 kilowatt light water reactor so national facility for neutron radiography all neutron studies neutron shielding and neutron activation researchers across india come and use the facility of neutron activation analysis the typical application in addition to our dae programs radiography of pyro devices many such applications have been envisaged for the space program this neutron radiography of irradiated fuel pins of bbtr mox fuel pins all are done here So, Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research basically caters to the needs of fast reactor programs. The reactor design group supports all the design related to the reactor. The fast reactor technology group envisages the sodium technology handling, sodium water reactions. Electronics and instrumentation groups supports all the control systems, health and safety, and the environmental group supports the societal applications and basic health physics aspects. the materials chemistry metal fuel cycle group basically produce metal fuels and also develop a pyrochemical process for reprocessing the spent metal fuel and we have a reprocessing group which takes care of reprocessing the spent fuel from abtr and the material science group in addition to the fundamental work they develop detectors for detecting plutonium americium using gamma spectroscopy like cadmium zinc telluride detectors then you have a metallurgy group which develop materials clad materials etc and other different materials for the reactor program we have engineering and resource management group supports that of course the reactor and the reactor facilities are completely taken care of in running fbtr comeni etc some of the important support to fbtr research programs includes metal fuel production we have set up uh, injection casting facility at ready chemistry laboratory for producing metal fuels of uranium plutonium zirconium The slugs were initially received from Bobo Atomic Research Center from the Oromel, and uh, they are made sodium bonded and made as fuel pins. And these pins are currently under irradiation at BTR. We also have a facility for production of direct oxide reduction method for converting the uranium oxide to uranium metal, just to support the metal fuel program. Metal fuels will be reprocessed by a high temperature non aqueous. electrochemical process so i will discuss this in due course so pyro process this program was initiated about uh, 10 years back now we have set up a facility for pyro processing of uranium containing alloys in a 10 kg scale and uranium plutonium alloys on the lab scale as an interim we also developed aqueous reprocessing of metal fuel in addition to that we have programs on fuels which includes uh, Measuring the fuel properties, thermal expansion, heat capacity, aqueous reprocessing of spent fuel because uh, the fast reactor fuels will have a high radiation, which are high plutonium, high burn up. So there are challenges in reprocessing the spent fuel. So this group caters to that. We have reactor physics and safety. So I will discuss some of these important highlights: uh, waste management because. Uh, 
The waste coming from fast reactor will have high noble metals and the fission product contents also will be about 80 kg per ton, unlike a thermal reactor fuel. So uh, we have developed iron phosphate glass based mattresses for that. As far as sodium is concerned, interaction of sodium with materials have been well studied and sensors are developed like electrochemical hydrogen meter which monitors and measures any leak of hydrogen right from PPB levels in liquid sodium. And we also have developed tin oxide based sensors for detecting hydrogen in the cover gas of a BTR. This will uh, support alongside the TCD detector because uh, tin oxide detectors could sense hydrogen as low as about 1 ppm. So it's at the early onset of any hydrogen that could be detected. So reprocessing and waste management, computational science, computational chemistry supports basically the identification of ligands for both reprocessing and the waste management. And these are the novel materials which are developed in the recent past which are used for recovering actinides from various waste streams. I will I'll go to this. This is the metal fuel uh, facility which was uh, established at Ready Chemistry Laboratory. It was uh, in the year 2018. It consists of series of glow box streams, right, from handling sodium to sodium bonding, qualification, metrology, and so on. Slugs qualification, both physical and chemical, will be done. Slug loading and settling. End plug welding, sodium bonding, and final qualification. The flow sheet, process equipment, for the injection casting technology, all were established. Sodium bonded metal fuel pins, which were received from BARC, enriched uranium, zirconium, uranium, plutonium, zirconium of various compositions are currently under irradiation at MBTR. Now, the facility has been established in the radiochemistry laboratory of IG Corp for producing uranium 6 zirconium. Soon this facility will be used for producing uranium, plutonium, zirconium as well. These pins are currently under irradiation at MBTR. One such fuel pin has been taken out at the low burn up, which has undergone PAE and uh, electro refining of spent fuel was also done, which I will show you in due course. And other fuels are currently under radiation at about 30,000 megawatt days per ton. And the metal fuels once produced will be qualified using X-ray radiography. This is the injection casting facility that is used for production of uh, uranium zirconium on a 10 kg scale. So traditionally oxide fuels will be reprocessed by a well established purex process where the spent fuel will be taken, it will be dissolved in nitric acid and you use 1.1 molar TBP in dodecane to isolate uranium plutonium and uh, the fission products and the minor actinides will go to HLW. However, the metal fuels which will be envisaged for the future fast reactors will be reprocessed by a non-aqueous high temperature electrochemical process it's called pyrochemical process. The methodology goes as follows. Lithium chloride, potassium chloride, eutactic, it's about 500 degrees which will be used as a molten salt medium which replaces typically TBP in dodecane in SS430 crucibles. The cathodes will be stainless steel or it could be a liquid cadmium cathode depending on uh, how quickly we are going to deposit uranium and uranium plutonium mixture. The spent fuel will be put in the anode basket. It could be 430 or tantalum anode basket. This will be electro refined. The alkali, alkaline earth and the lanthanides will form chlorides and they will stay, once they slip into the salt phase, they will form the stable chlorides and they will stay in the salt phase. Uranium plutonium will, along with americium, will come into the salt phase. They form chlorides. Initially, uranium will be deposited on the SS cathode. And further electro refining, uranium, plutonium, americium together will deposit on the liquid cadmium cathode. Noble metals, ruthenium, rhodium, and palladium will remain in the anode basket. So once electro refining is done, the, the uranium or plutonium mix ingots will be taken. The salts will be distilled and you will prepare the ingots and this will go to the uh, reactor again. So this is the methodology of uh, high temperature pyrochemical process methodology. The challenges are handling chlorate salts which are highly corrosive. The temperature of operation is typically about 500 to 550 degrees centigrade. These are the two major challenges and the decontamination factor what you will get in the pyro process will be typically about 1 in 100 to 1 in 500. Of course, this is adequate for fast reactors because the fuels 
we'll go back to phosphate reactor, whereas the typical decontamination factors from Purex process could be as high as about 1 in 10 power 6, 1 in 10 power 7. But uh, there is no need for having such high decontamination factor, especially when the fuel goes back to the fast reactor. The advantages are uranium plutonium, ammunition will be co-deposited, number one, and it's very compact. And uh, short cooled high burn up fuels can be directly taken for pyrochemical process. These are the major advantages of uh, pyro process. Of course, the challenges are not only handling highly corrosive salts, the remote operations, you have to make it everything remote and to be handled in hot cells, that's a big challenge when you scale up. And the other one is it's also a batch process actually, typically 10 kg per batch. At Indira Gandhi Center of Atomic Research, we have established a 10 kg pyro process facility for electro refining uranium and uranium containing alloys. This natural uranium and uranium containing alloys, uranium zirconium, uranium zirconium gadolinium simulating plutonium. This is a 10 kg facility. The, the, the fuel will be taken in the anode basket. It will be electro refined. This is a typical uranium will be deposited as a typical dendrima on the SS cathode. The salts will be scrapped. Then it will be distilled under vacuum, organ atmosphere. Then you heat it to produce the uranium ingots. So this is a this is a run typically demonstrating electrochemical uh, production of uranium as a metal. Of course, uh, now we we modify this electrode setup to handle liquid cadmium cathode as well because the future operations include electro refining uranium plutonium mixed alloys, and uh, in that occasion we may need cadmium liquid cadmium cathode. Of, of course, for uranium plutonium zirconium alloy, technology is developed on a lab scale where we have done the electro refining of UPU alloy from a tantalum basket. Uranium was deposited on the SS cathode and plutonium and uranium alongside was deposited on the liquid cadmium cathode. One such pin from EBTR, the fuel which has seen a burn up of about uh, 2000 megawatt days per ton, low burn up, of course, we have taken out, it was taken to hot cells of the ready metallurgy lab, then it was moved to ready chemistry lab. After that, after the preliminary workup, and a, a special electro refiner was installed in the hot cells. The electro refining of the spent fuel was done in hot cell. This is a first such run, and uh, the results are pretty encouraging. Zirconium in the product uranium was found to be less than or close to 0.1 percentage, uh, supporting the, the typical pyrochemical process. As far as fuel reprocessing is concerned, the major challenges in reprocessing the fast reactor fuels are the high radioactivity associated with that. The burn up will be typically about 100,000 megawatt days per ton. FBTR fuels have seen as high as about 165 gigawatt days per ton. So you have to reprocess the spent fuel which have a very high activity, typically about 15 times more than the PHWR fuels, number one. Number two, high plutonium associated with the fast reactor fuels because during solvent extraction with tributyl phosphate, plutonium has a tendency to form third phase. In other words, when the aqueous phase containing the dissolved solution of spent fuel is contacted with the organic phase TBP in dodecane, when the plutonium concentration exceeds beyond 70 GPL, the organic phase will split into two further phases, metal rich and diluent rich, which is highly undesirable in the reprocessing plants because that will lead to criticality related issues. So hence the throughput of plutonium is deliberately reduced to overcome this issue. In, in, in addition to that, the high radiation associated with the spent fuel degrades your solvent, TBP and dodecane. So in other words, that means the contact time of the, the fuel with the organic solvent should be as low as possible and to overcome these centrifugal extractors are designed so the challenges are process and equipment, process modeling, and of course in addition to uh, carbide fuels, we also dissolve the ceramic uh, mixed oxide fuels. So this coral facility supports uh, reprocessing of the ability of spent fuel. Many such campaigns have been already done. In addition to tributyl phosphate, IgCAR has developed a solvent, triisoamyl phosphate, 
which is a fifth member. C4 is a tributyl phosphate and C5 is a triethyl phosphate, which is the same family as of TBP. It meets all the requirements of TBP. In addition to that, this solvent does not form third phase. In other words, you can load plutonium to its maximum capacity in case of using triamyl phosphate. So laboratory scale experiments have been done. This solvent has been qualified. This is also qualified by extracting with zirconium and thorium, etc. I hope some stage this solvent will catch up with the coral plant, maybe in the years ahead. This solvent, in support of AV water boat, we could make several thousands of liters of this solvent. I'm sure this solvent will, will be the solvent in future coral plants. This is a third phase. I will not go into the details, but uh, when plutonium is contacted with TBP at a very high concentration, the organic phase will split into two phases, metal rich and diluent rich, which is undesirable. So either you have to reduce the plutonium or use an alternate solvent. And triisoamyl phosphate offers an opportunity for its use in the reprocessing plants. As far as fuel properties are concerned, one such uh, facility is Knudsen Effusion Mass Spectrometer. This facility is put up in a glow box to study the vaporization behavior of either metal fuels, carbides, or oxides at high temperature, typically about 1487 to 1641 Kelvin. This is one such data, PT relations in the metal fuel, UPU ZR. You can look at it, the plutonium uh, partial pressure, it's only typically about 10 power minus 4 pascals at the temperatures indicating that it's a very very small number and you also get the enthalpy vaporization data so this technique of Knudsen efficient mass spectrometer where you have a sample you do electron bombardment and get the Knudsen effusion you measure the vapor pressure from which you get the crucial data how far the fuel can be safely taken to and what is the typical enthalpy of vaporization, etc. So this facility is used to get the vapor pressure data on fuel materials, as well as the pyrochemical salts as well. Lithium chloride, potassium chloride, uranium chloride, mix is used for pyroprocessing. So both for fuels as well as pyro salts, this facility is used. This is a facility set up solidus liquidus temperature to measure the solidus liquidus, equivalent to melting point, etc. The solidus is uh, the highest temperature at which you can keep the alloy in its solid state and the liquidus is the, the temperature at which the complete building of the solid phase in an alloy. So this facility is set up, basically it works on the reflectivity. When you have a solid phase, you have a different image. When you have a complete liquid, you have a different image. This facility is set up to measure the solidus liquidus temperatures of metal fuels, carbide fuels, etc. Post-radiation examination of the spent fuel is one of the key component for nuclear waste management and uh, there are many such studies have been done. One such study I, I just show here, uh, post-radiation examination of FBTR spent fuel at uh, 2550, 100, 165 gigawatt days per ton. The spent fuel was taken out, it was uh, taken to hot cells, dissolved and the burn up measurements, burn up is the number of fissions per hundred initial heavy element atoms in atom percent fission or the total amount of energy that could be extracted from fuel. The burn up was measured in the shortest possible time. For example, the spent fuel was taken, dissolved, the dissolver solution was directly put into a, an instrument called high pressure chromatography system where you have uranium, plutonium, all the rarets which are separated. The concentration of neodymium and plutonium are correlated to burn up of uh, nuclear fuel. Similarly, this Uranium, plutonium, neodymium fractions were also taken to mass spectrometer to get the isotopic abundance for which one could get the burn-up. So these are the new burn-up monitors that are developed at AGCAR, lanthanum-139, neodymium-143, and molybdenum. To assay plutonium, in addition to the traditional methods like potentiometry, etc., uh, hybrid cage technique has been used. It's a non-destructive technique where the X-rays are shined on plutonium samples. The emitted intensity of the emitted X-rays were used to compute the concentration of plutonium. In the recent past, a radioactive calorimeter has been developed at IGCAR. Both single cell and twin cells are developed. This works on the principle of 
Measuring the concentration from the radioactive decay heat is useful for measuring the plutonium concentration, especially in the packed packets. The key is you have to get the isotopic abundance of plutonium. So you get the total heat, but if you have uh, isotopic abundance data, it will be much easier to compute. And a gamma spectrometry alongside this could be effectively used to assay plutonium non-destructively. The radioisotopes produced at EBITR include strontium-89. This was produced by radiation of yttrium-89 NP reaction. It's had about uh, 42 hours half-life. Seven irradiation campaigns have been done. This is work is done in collaboration with RPC, BARC, and BRIT. Now, currently, it is under uh, uh, animal testing. After that, once uh, successful, it will go to BRIT for uh, production. It will be produced and it will be transferred to BRIT. This isotope is used for bone pain palliation. Yttrium-90 is another important isotope in radiopharmaceutical. It is used for uh, curing liver cancer. This is produced from the HLW of uh, phosphate reactor liquid waste. You separate basically strontium from the spent fuel. And uh, once you separate strontium, you purify by ion exchange, then use a crown ether containing support to milk yttrium as and when required. This is in the early stage of production at IGCAR. The other isotope is uh, phosphorus 32 from sulfur 32 by NP reaction. Currently, this is uh, to go into the EBTR soon. And uh, in 2024, possibly in the month of April, the first samples will be given to BRIT. And this isotope mostly will be used for biological studies. So EBTR also offers opportunities for this sort of reactions, NP reactions. And these are the typical uh, uh, photographs associated with the production of strontium, right from production of pellets, pins, going into the reactor to radiometallurgy labs, transfer to RCL hot cells, then purification. Dr. Shivraman, yeah. you may please accelerate a bit. Yeah, I'll be closing now. This is a typical iron phosphate glass, which I was talking to you, for processing the fast reactor waste. It's a typical monolith. It is made of uh, iron oxide and uh, P2O3. This can accommodate uh, loading assay as about 50 weight percent. Supercritical technology is used for recovering actinides from waste, where supercritical carbon dioxide containing ligands are used. The advantage of technology is uh, carbon dioxide post-extraction becomes a gas and you have a very liquid, very minimum liquid waste generation. One such facility is put in a glow box for recovery of plutonium, americium, other actinides from waste such as polymers, salts, alloy waste. This is on the lab scale. And these are the new molecules which I was talking, metal organic frameworks for recovery of actinides for various dilute streams. And the computational group supports the ligands which we envisage because very difficult to carry out many such experiments working with radioactive and with plutonium samples. So the computation group supports using DFT to screen which ligands could be potentially used. These are the electrochemical hydrogen meters which I was mentioning to use measure hydrogen in liquid sodium in as low as about you know, PPB levels, several years of operating experience. One such is also earlier installed in Phoenix and Super Phoenix, and it's also to be installed in the prototype BRs shortly. It basically works on concentration cells, a mixture of calcium bromate, calcium hydride to measure the hydrogen concentration. This is the tin oxide based sensor which is installed in the cover gas to monitor hydrogen right from 1 ppm to 50 ppm. This will work alongside with TCD detector. Safety research in the case of any accidental release and uh, using the wind profile and the wind velocity, you can track iden 131 or xenon or krypton. One such facility has been established at AGCAR. And this is the high temperature, high pressure cycling facility. And this is a seismic qualification for a nuclear reactor. We have a 10 ton facility as well. The metallurgical group supports basically the research and development activities for Indian phosphate reactor program. The major ones are this, you know. The IFAC, Indian Phosphate Reactor, iron 15, uh, 15 nickel titanium based for fuel cladding. And the other one is ODS based one. Uh, these are the development and testing of phosphate reactor components. Steam generated test facility basically for sodium water interaction, fuel subassembly for studying the water or the liquid coolant profile, sodium leak studies, 
using a conductivity detector one could do that under sodium ultrasonic scanner using physioelectric and earlier we had a boron enrichment plant for production of enriched boron now the technology is uh, moved to heavy water boat way forward just quickly i will cover complete with my last four slides that is uh, fbtr program started the fbr program with fbtr and the prototype industrials pfbr 500 megawatt is in the advanced stage of commissioning now it's the fbr program closed fuel cycle co-located fuel cycle facility with pfbr and uh, of course we envisage two more fbrs and one fbtr2 possibly a metal fuel fbtr2 in the near future of course the key is economy and uh, safety and this is how it goes the spent fuel from fbtr will go to coral it will be reprocessed and the DFRP is in the advanced stage of commissioning now. Coal commissioning has been done. The spent fuels from uh, this uh, BTO will also go to DFRP. Then FRSCF will, uh, the spent fuels from PFBR will go to uh, PFBR and FBRs 1 and 2. And uh, the future endeavors include uh, metal fuel based uh, reactors. Just uh, my last uh, couple of slides. Uh, SMRs are envisaged at IGCR. My colleagues are here who can support that. And uh, it's about 100 megawatt. And uh, to start with, it's a low enriched uranium plutonium based fuels. And uh, metallic fuels are envisaged in the long run. The key is the longer fuel refueling time, about five to 10 years, with reduced LHR. That means, uh, in my opinion, metal fuels will play a major role in achieving these endeavors. That is, a long refueling time. And uh, of course, clean hydrogen production in collaboration with BARC. One is alkaline water electrolysis. The second one is sulfur iodine process. This is, uh, we, shall we shall use uh, a bit or produce electrical energy. And the second part will use the high temperature steam, which is coming from a BTR for production of uh, clean hydrogen. These two, uh, this possibly will happen quickly, these two. Of course, the way forward is uh, setting up of the metal fuel production as well as the pyro processing in hot cells. Uh, because uh, if you use a metal fuel, the pyro processing facility should be made ready. I hope uh, the metal fuel facility will be, uh, the, the initial works will be done now. Hope to see the full uh, reprocessing facility for metal fuel will be established in this time scale. I think Indian nuclear program owes a lot to this legend, Dr. Homi Jahangir Baba. Uh, I think uh, acknowledgments to all his contributions. And before I close, any nuclear fission related topics, I always recall this very interesting incident. Enrico Fermi, 1938 Nobel laureate for his contribution to nuclear reactors. He bombarded every element in the periodic table with neutron. One such occasion when he bombarded neutron on uranium, he was getting barium-138. And every time he was getting barium, he was thinking it was an impurity. So he just missed nuclear fission. Frederick and Irene Juliet Curie, they too, they studied interaction of neutron with every material. They also missed nuclear fission. Of course, they come out with artificial radioactivity on bombarding alpha particle on aluminum. You know, they produce phosphorus 32. So the message is, uh, you know, uh, they, 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 though they missed the nuclear fission, the other parts they could capture. So that's a very interesting thing. Yeah, Kalpakam, as I said, it's a beautiful green, green complex. The SOX, the NOx levels are pretty low. The key is the biodiversity, which is there in the Kalpakam complex, the butterflies, the birds. And uh, I think that's uh, about uh, GCAR. Thank you all for your kind attention.